When we talk about rebuilding North American manufacturing, we're usually talking about parts. The components that go into everything we use. Automotive, aerospace, contract manufacturing. But what about the tooling that these massive production facilities rely on to actually make those parts? From carbide blank final coating, Walter USA is manufacturing some of the most advanced drilling tools on the planet, right here in South Carolina. This is the Walter production unit Greer. This is where we manufacture stateside manufacturing of our solid carbide drills. So inside this building, we're only manufacturing drills, we're not doing end mills or any of that stuff, just uh, solid carbide drills. Solid carbide drills, non through coolant and through coolant come through here. We have, uh, we manufacture specials through this facility as well. It's not all just standard product, we do specials here. Um, we have all of, our, all of our stock stored inside the cage here, so everything is, everything is compliant. Oh, wow. That whole stacker is full of solid carbide blanks. Oh, really? And then all, the, all these uh, racks down here are all full of solid how, carbide blanks. How many carbide blanks would you guys have in here on an average day, roughly? I, I, well, we have the capacity to manufacture um, about 350 to 400,000 drills a year. 400,000? Yeah, so we, we manufacture about 1,000 drills a day if we're running 24-7. That's really important for a lot of companies out there where nothing can disrupt their supply chain right, there right. because it's right here. Made, made stateside, it's not going to get stuck in a container somewhere in the water, it's, it's coming out here. So this is the first, first operation on the land or on the, in the shop is going to be our cutoff operation, right? So our tools are going to come off, we're going to come in as raw blanks like this. So this, is what our, so this is what our raw blanks are going to look like. The way that those coolant holes are put in there, because they actually aren't just straight holes most of the time, no. they are helix. It's actually helixed in there with the, with the tool. So when, when the carbide rod is made, it's actually, it's actually extruded. So it comes out, uh, the way I tell everybody when we do the, the tour through here is it's like a, uh, like a really expensive Play-Doh Fun Factory. Right. So it, it's extruded out, there's two wires inside of that form and they actually, it actually helixes on the outside. Oh, I always wondered how they got that. When carbide comes out of the extrusion process, it's about the consistency of like a hard pencil eraser. Really? Like you can actually take it, you can snap it in half. It's kind of like, kind of like a, kind of like a mix between like chalk and like a pencil eraser. It's right. got a lot of, got a lot of binder in it. When we fire it, it shrinks down to the prescribed size. And uh, you know the through coolant holes are already in there. We've got non coolant through blanks. This area here is actually going to uh, establish the uh, the chucking diameter. Oh, cool! So if we look, uh, we look at this point. This is our these are our cutoff blanks coming in, and like you see some of the serrations on the outside oh, wow. of them. Um, you'll see a, you'll see something like this. So this will be precision ground on the OD. It'll get loaded in the machine in an ER collet because the the con concentricity isn't super important at this point. <laughs> we're we're establishing that that chucking diameter. We're going to hold probably a tenth on that chucking diameter. So you've got your your chucking diameter, and we're establishing our 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 end our angle on the end is going to be your actual uh, your cutting edge. That's going to be your center. So <laughs> instead of having like a sixty degree center like you'd have on a traditional grinding operation, you're going to have a a male center on both ends. So you got a male center on this end, a male center on this end. Ah, okay. And then you've got a slot across there so we can get coolant into our coolant holes. So if you've got a stop in the back of your tool holder and coolant can't get around it, that's how you get your MQL or your coolant into the into the slots. You in the guys back have end. thought of this stuff before, haven't you? We, we've we've spent a couple <laughs> spent a couple years playing around with the process, right? Most of the machines share coolant systems, so we this is a very climate controlled environment here. Yes. We've got the the big fans on the ceiling to distribute air. All the coolant is maintained at that same temperature that the air temperature is, because if you have a couple of degrees of fluctuation, when you're trying to hold a ten thousandth of an inch, see you later. It, it, it's, it's all over the place, right? Wow. So the next stop, if if they weren't precision ground, they come in here, and these are uh, centerless grinders. So oh. so we can load up material on the racks on the on the left side. Um, it'll robotically drop them in, and you on, in a in a centerless grinding operation. So you've got a, a regulating wheel on one side and you've got a grinding wheel on the other side. So this one is going to be a little more like a cork consistency. Right. So that maintains your diameter and the rotating speed of that of that blank. And then the other tool comes, the other grinding wheel comes in and, it's actually and doing takes the it to the diameter, right? Makes sense. We can also through feed where we can put a little bit of an angle on that, that grinding wheel. And if we've got to take, you know, if we've got a batch, we've got to take 10 thousandths of an inch off. Our drills are ground to an H7 tolerance on a lot of them. So, you know, depending on the diameter of drill, that, that tolerance changes. But you're talking sure. tenths. You're talking ten thousandths of an inch on 
at the most on everything. I right. Mean, we're Even not. When you're getting up we there. don't have a thou on anything. A thousandth right. of an inch would be a huge tolerance for us. It'd be right. like that'd be a mile. So you guys are working to a slightly different standard here. Yeah, there's a little here, different then. standard when, you, when well, you're. I mean, we're we're giving you an almost ream finish from our solid carbide drills. Right. Especially when you've got two margins, four margins, you've got all the margins on the drill. You're going to get a really nice finish. But if you don't have that diameter, it's. I mean, who wants to who wants to run a high performance drill and then run a run a reamer into finish right. the size? Doesn't right? really make sense. So. profilometers and uh, all the kind of stuff we look at you would, you would expect to see in an inspection oh. room right so this first room a roll or first roll of roll and the uh, the other machinery here so this area here we established our chucking diameter in these machines behind us we established that chucking diameter now we're establishing the cutting diameter so the cutting diameter is probably the first let's say 10 to 20 percent of the drill is going to be right. the actual cutting diameter and then we start getting into a back taper so we've got a back taper from the cutting diameter down to a relief area down here. We still have our center on this end and our center on this end. We have our slot across the back end where we have our, our through coolant holes. Everything is you know, established. Uh, if, if, we, if we see any specials, you'll see the USB stick kind of with it going along. All the part numbers are up on here. You'll see, you know, you'll be able to tell, well, this is a, a DC-160, 20 times D drill, 16 millimeter. So this is- 20 times D. 20 times D, almost 5 eighths of an inch diameter, right? So, and you can see the actual serrations on the outside of it. So you can see we've established, you know, our centers, but we haven't established the diameters on here yet. So they'll grind the diameter, they'll grind this diameter in, but you can see the, on the serrations. But that is to help clock yeah, where you can that see, is. You can see the one, the one different groove, and you can see how that lines right up with that, with that through, that through coolant hole. Because it's very difficult to, if you get that even slightly off, you're grinding through a flute, that oh, thing yeah. has no structure. Yeah, it, it's all done. So yeah. it's, it's going in the scrap bin, and you don't want to be throwing things like this away. No, I don't want to know how much that costs <laughs> even in that form. You guys even do some of the uh, smaller diameter, you know, 20, 30 times D. Yep, so this is going to be a, 20 times D, uh, 6.35 millimeters, so that's a quarter inch, right? Yep. So, wow. We make, we manufacture a lot of the inch size tools here in the States. Um, a lot of our metric stuff is still made over in, in Europe and our facilities over there. We do make a lot of metric stuff here, but you can see, uh, we can start seeing some of our specials. You can see that it's got the cutting di or the cutting edge here, and then it's got a second diameter on the back side of that. So it might be something that's doing a drill and countersink at right, the same drill, time. Right, drill and countersink at the same time. It might have a different radius in the corner. Is and it, when companies are ordering specials, obviously it's going to be highly customer dependent, but is it, you know, five parts? Is it a hundred parts? Depends on the customer, I guess. So when we generate the quote with Express, um, the Express system will give you price breaks for uh, three parts, five parts, ten parts, up to up to 200 pieces. Right. If you order more than 50 pieces, it extends the lead time a little bit. But um, it, it, we have, I, I used to have customers that would, would do this, this, they'd order three drills to get up and running or to, to do a prototype run, and then they'd order 25 drills for the actual production run. And you can see more of the pallets. You can see a little robot back there with a, with a stock of oh, uh, cool. material getting ready to go in. So that, this machine, that's one of the ones that's doing the um, establishing geometry. Somebody goes, puts this in there, and it will run on its own. Does this run lights out all night? So the, the goal in the building is, I think we have one operator on three machines, and that operator will run, it, the machines will be manned for, for eight hours, and then at the end of the shift, we make sure the pallets are loaded up so we can get four hours of unmanned operation. Beautiful. So we get 12 hours for an eight hour shift, and then we do it again, so we have first shift, second shift, but we get three shifts worth of work. And nobody's sitting there literally putting one part in at a time all right, day. Right. I mean, there's built in inspection inside the machines as well, so it's gonna check the diameters and stuff before it takes it out. And you can see that the robot's holding onto a piece of material. It'll, it'll load raw material in and it'll put finished parts back in the other pallet. Again, more long length of diameter ratio stuff. Wow. More grinding wheels. Look at these. Everywhere you look, more you guys have inspection. more machines. More machines, yeah. This is, this is, I think this is actually considerably smaller than what our, our German facility is, but uh, this is a good sized machine shop. And as far as machine shops go, you know, I'll, I'll get on my soapbox and, and, and say a little bit about trying to get kids into this trade and trying to get young people interested in this trade. People have this misconception that, you know, machine shop work is filthy, dirty, 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 dirty work. This is, I mean, it's 72 degrees. There's no, there's no smoke in the area. We're running, we're running coolant, we're running uh, oil coolant in all these machines at 1,000 PSI. This is a clean machine shop. I oh mean, yeah, this is, no, it looks more like a laboratory than a you could literally, factory. You could literally, I mean, I don't know if I'd eat off the floor, but you could if you wanted to. I mean, <laughs> probably wouldn't go too bad. You know? It's not, it, 
you, you try to get young people interested in this trade and try to explain to them what this is all about. I mean, these are good paying jobs. Oh yeah. Right here in South Carolina. <laughs>start establishing some of our geometry so we're, we're going to put our fluting in so this is the clamping diameter and then you got your cutting diameter we made the cutting diameter bigger than bigger than the clamping diameter which isn't the standard right and then we've got a nice 45 90 degree included angle i've never seen a carbide drill with a step in it like that any geometry that's going to be done on the end any gashing on it is going to be done here so that's what this row of machinery right here is doing is uh fluting and end work wow. and on the back side of this machine we can take a look um, oh, so look at that. So this robot here will actually load and unload wheel packs. So he'll go over and grab a wheel pack and load it in. Oh, and, all uh, on the back? Yeah, so that's all the different oh, wheel packs we're making different, different tools. Yeah, essentially, it's uh, like a giant tool changer. Right, right. But most places don't have this. Look at these. Now, that is straight, I mean, this is coated, obviously. Right, right. These are already through coating. But that finish, is that what that comes off, like, right off the machine with that polished flute and everything? So the, the flute polishing actually happens. We got a machine back here, so that's a, a post plating. Pro I mean, they're gonna oh, come out wow. really polished, but we, we polish them even more. We make drills all the way down to, in this facility, I think we go down to about two millimeters, but as a company, we go down to four thousandths of oh. an inch. For, and the smallest uh, smallest through coolant drills we manufacture are 70 thousandths in diameter. With through coolant? With through coolant. I mean, obviously, you have to have crazy filtration well, yes. to get to get. Fine. I mean, the coolant holes are you know a, a, a few thousandths of an inch. Wow. Yeah. This is kind of like another another. Uh, it's almost a third business under the same roof. So this is our reconditioning and remanufacturing area. So all the logistics for reconditioning go through that room. All the reconditioning is going to go in here. It's going to be received in through the back door. Something that we do different than a lot of our competitors. I mean, when you send in your drills for reconditioning, you're going to have an EDP number for that reconditioning. You're going to know exactly what it's going to cost when you send it in. It's ah. not it's not a send it in and we'll evaluate it Find and tell you it what later. it's going to cost. It's a send it in, you know exactly what it's going to cost. The only time they won't recondition it, if it's too far gone, they'll send it back to you or they'll pay you for scrap price. So on. even if you're paying a lot of money for a custom drill because you want that efficiency, it's not like it's a throwaway at the end of the day. The company line is we'll do we'll do three reconditioning cycles on it. We take about three millimeters off every time we recondition it. So uh, you'll get three, we'll guarantee three reconditioning cycles out of our drills as long as it's not really abused and torn up. Uh, we'll, we'll knock about three millimeters off each time and, and send it back to you with the same factory edge, the same factory edge prep, same coating. This Anka is uh, part of the secret sauce. So anybody can buy anybody can buy a lot of these machines. Right. We do a little bit of tweaking when they come in here so that, so that you know, it's, it puts us apart from the competition, right? For sure. You can see the robot load and unload here. So it's it's getting a part, a finished part out. So it's going to come out, it's going to stick it in one of the pallets and it's going to do the tool change or do the part change. You know, for a long time people were saying, oh, automation's going to take jobs. Do you really think anybody wants the job of picking that up and putting it down there for yeah. eight hours a day? Eight, eight hours a day. It lets the people here do a lot more important things with their time rather than you know, literally putting every single little part in. Right. Pallet, now I can go program, now I can do inspection, now right, I can right. do whatever. Well, it, it, it's, it's better util utilization of the human resources. Right. We have every, every company has a human resources department, right? We have, a, we have a lot of human resources on this floor and, you know, these guys are skilled, trained people. They know what they're doing, they know how to make drills, they know how to run these machines. I didn't realize vessels. there was more over here. Well, this is all actually a brand new addition where we put our coating vessels. Super secret sauce is really made. Look so, at that thing. So this is so this is a. Uh, I mean, it looks like an MRI machine. Like yeah. it looks like you're going to go in there and get your brain scanned or something, right? I don't think I'd want to do that. In this one, would I? <laughs> so. What it really is is a very, very, very fancy dishwasher. So uh, everything comes in off the floor with oil and, and a little bit of grinding swarf on it. It'll go in here, it'll, uh, it'll get turned around and washed and, and cleaned up. We check all the coolant holes and make sure we have flow through all the coolant holes at that point. So if you walk back in here, so this is gonna be, so we have a pallet, uh, uh, basically a, a little forklift for moving the pallets of drills. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So all it does is pick up those pallets of drills and loads them in and out. This machine here is gonna be a dryer uh, dryer and a preheater, so it's a lot less expensive to 
preheat the drills because they got to get up to temperature for coating. It's, it's less expensive to heat them up in here than it is to do it in the actual coating vessel. This is where we actually load our drills oh, into, our, into the uh, for, for coating. So uh, customers ask us all the time, like, why, why, don't you, why don't you coat the whole drill? Why do you only coat the tip of the drill on those long length of diameter ratios? Are you, are you, are you saving money? This is way more expensive to do this. If you look at these drills over here, so these are you know long length of diameter, and all of that all of that masking that's stacked up on there is done by a person. Oh, this is masking. Yeah, that's just oh, okay, that's got all, it. so all we're coating is that that last little uh, tip of the drill. It's right? a lot more labor intensive to do. A lot more labor int labor intensive to do it because, like I said, people will ask you, well, why don't you coat the whole thing? Well, the honest reason is chips flow better on a polished flute. Right. So the chips are gonna get out of the hole faster on that polished flute without coating on there. If we coat the whole thing, we end up with chip binding issues and we end up with chips sticking in there. Now at interest, because I'm sure you guys have done it before, when you're looking at a raw carbide drill like this, so it's yep. been polished, let's talk about you know maybe the Crado Tech or what's the, the gold one, but what kind of tool length difference would you get between an uncoated and a coated? Are we talking 100%, are we talking 30%? Like where does that kind of fall? And I know it depends on the application and the I think it depends on the application, depends on the material. If you're running it in an aerospace alloy, the, your, your drill's gonna be smoked in, in a matter of a couple parts compared to having the actual coating on it. The coatings, right. actually, the coatings actually get harder when they get hot. So the hot hardness is actually higher than the room temperature oh, hardness on the coatings. Weird. All the coatings we do inside this, this building are all gonna be PVD coatings. So we, the, the machine hmm. we do here, so you got PVD and CVD. So you've got, uh, physical vapor deposition of your PVD. So PVD is gonna be physical vapor deposition. So as these, as these tools are in the coating vessel, these are all spinning. So all these are on their own little carousel. So these all spin, oh. the, drills themselves, the drills themselves spin, and the whole carousel spins inside that. Oh. It's like the worst tilt a whirl you've ever been yeah, on right. at, the, at, the, at the amusement park. Feel right? motion sick just looking at it. In order to apply the coating, uh, in a PVD operation, you need to have line of sight. So you gotta, it, it, it's basically like, a photon uh, spray paint. So this is a, an Orlicon from Balzers. Wow. It's the latest, greatest technology. We have the longest capacity in, not only in the Walter group, but inside the Sandvik group. It, for really? as long as drills, we can make longer drills, or coat longer drills than anybody else in our, in our company. This is super, super specialized equipment. Super specialized wow. equipment. Wow. What Jeez. you'll have is your, your plates of your elements. So what we're doing is we're striking an arc between these two plates. Okay. So it's like, Kind of like plasma, you got, a, you got a, 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 a charge of plasma going from one side to the other. So you've got a charge coming from this side to the, really? from, the, from the positive to the negative. And you're depositing uh, ions onto the, onto the outside of the drill. I've always wondered, I always thought it was just like a dip or something. No, no this no, is... It's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it goes inside there and we strike an arc and, and the, we pass the drills through the arc. That's how we deposit that coating on there. The fact that we're doing it all here in the States is, is a big deal to me. Oh, for sure. It, it should be a big deal to anybody, I think, in manufacturing that is, I mean, it's, it's a big deal to us. It's a big deal to our customers. It's a really big deal to the unions out there. Uh, there's a lot of shops out there that, you know, if you want to bring in something that's not made in the USA, forget about it. You know I mean, what I mean? A, a big thing is we always talk about rebuilding North American manufacturing, but people are always thinking about end products. They're thinking about the cars. This is almost a more critical thing in my opinion, because oh, 100%. if you have to buy the tooling offshore to make the thing you make here, well, now you're still introducing that extra layer of risk, right, right. the extra layer of something going wrong. If you can control the whole process from bottom up here. What, and that's really what our focus has been here in, in this facility is to be you know, very vertically integrated. We started with raw material. We were all the way back here in the coating vessels now, right? right. So we, we've gone from, you know, from the beginning to the end and, and the tools will come out of here. They'll go to our, our shipping department. So you guys are not only doing well here in terms of production, you're expanding what you do here and you're expanding the production. 100%. I mean, there's still room to put in more machines if you wanted to, which is a good thing. Yeah, we just put, there's two brand new machines down on the end of the uh, fluting aisle. There's two brand new machines down there. They took our our, uh, our length capacity. Now we can manufacture 500 millimeter long drills Ooh. here. As we're introducing the new DD170, we're, we're putting longer length to diameter ratios on the shelf along with that. So we're putting uh, I think we're going to have 30 times D drills in that series on the shelf. We have up to 30 times D and DC 160s on the shelf right now. Uh, so we're always expanding our, our, our offering and what we're stocking on the shelf.